You may be seated as we uh, focus on God's Word for this day. It's the um, 13th and the 14th chapter in the book of Acts. Gene is going to join me as narrator, and you all are going to join me as the crowd. You have a line you may see in the bulletin that will also appear on the screen. In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manon, a member of the court of Herod the ruler, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. In Lystra there was a man sitting who could not use his feet and had never walked, for he had been crippled from birth. He listened to Paul as he was speaking, and Paul, looking at him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And the man sprang up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted, The God. Barnabas, they called Zeus, and Paul, they called Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates. He and the crowds wanted to offer sacrifice. When the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of it, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd, shouting, Friends, why are you doing this? We are mortals just like you, and we bring you good news, that you should turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to follow their own ways, yet he has not left himself without a witness in doing good, giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling you with food and your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the crowds from offering sacrifice to them. This is God's story. Our, Our story. story. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. On occasions like uh, last Sunday, the Sunday before when I'm not preaching at, uh, at the services, I'll try to sneak away and visit another church to worship God and to learn. And um, probably a couple of years ago, I worshiped at St. Matthew's in Wauwatosa on just such a Sunday. They have um, the, uh, probably the finest organist in the entire uh, metro area, a guy named John Paradowski. It was a delight to worship at St. Matthew's a couple of years ago. While I sat down in worship, it was fun to see um, a, a family sitting right in front of me, a mom and dad and two kids, uh, probably the oldest of the children was second grade, and I happened to notice that he was uh, paging through a, um, a, a book of Greek gods, and uh, a bunch of thoughts occurred to me. One. Um, I thought, how wonderful that we have a family worshiping God together, and um, we are so grateful to be at church where uh, children are often uh, reminded that they are a gift from God and um, so important to us. I, I don't know if you've noticed uh, a new box that's on the second page of our uh, At One that's uh, right at the top declaring uh, over and over for us to remember that when children are present in church and making noise, we should be thankful. Uh, if I learned one thing at all peoples, it's to keep preaching when there's children making noise, so <laughs> they won't slow me down. And um, I was just delighted to see the, the kids worshiping there, and I, I certainly didn't feel any kind of a judgmental thought, but I did think it was interesting in this Christian church that the kid was paging through a book of Greek gods. I just, you know, it's just a book. Well, hang on to that thought as we, uh, as we experience this launch of God's mission. Um, 
There's a lot of ground to cover today, so let me uh, jump right in. We begin with the commissioning of uh, two people, Paul and Barnabas. The uh, commissioning that's described in this um, introductory, introductory verse from these verses from the 13th chapter of Acts. Commissioning meaning that they were called, uh, having been identified to further or advance the mission of God. And uh, it's, it's interesting to see the Holy Spirit interacting here. Um, it, it, it sometimes when we read the Bible, it, it sounds like, wow, they got zapped. Or, uh, you know, he, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul. Was this like attention Kmart shoppers? Or how did this happen that uh, they got this message? Um, I don't know how you've experienced callings in your life, uh, a sense that you are needing to do something. Um, but I know for me, it is uh, something that I, often I've thought about for a long time, and then there is a sense of conviction in my heart that now's the time. I'm not sure how the Spirit works, but it's clear that uh, this was a community, uh, communal experience and was involved uh, in, in, in moving them in faith. Our life groups are going to spend some time thinking about some details we don't have time for here, but it's quite interesting when you look at uh, people like uh, Simeon the Niger and uh, Manan the, of the court of Herod. A lot of things were happening in the early faith communities that had begun to gather in the years after Jesus' resurrection. And so even though this is like the beginning, the launch of God's mission into the world, we shouldn't be misled to think that nothing had been happening yet. A lot had been percolating, and now Paul and Barnabas are set aside. We should um, note, as we fill out some of our uh, blanks in the bulletin, if you like to play along there, that, that this is a great introduction to the overall theme of the book of Acts. If you want to sum up the book of the Acts, the actions of the apostles, it is that uh, is Jesus having said, both in the Gospels and then in the early uh, chapter, uh, chapter 1 of Acts, you shall be my witnesses to the end of the earth. And uh, what unfolds in the story of the Acts is the experience of people becoming witnesses, being commissioned and called, and today it's Paul and Barnabas. Now, as we think about these two gentlemen setting out, would, uh, I want us to, to note a couple of things. First of all, that though the Holy Spirit is involved and, and gives us a sense of conviction in our life that we need to do something specific that, that is uh, going to make a difference in the world, uh, there's nevertheless the reality that God calls specific people for specific purposes. This is not kind of magic. God is working with human beings who have this sense of conviction and call, and, um, and they're responding. Why, why is this relevant? Well, it's, it's no overstatement to observe in this world, in this current state of affairs that governs this planet, that there's a desperate need for people to hear and respond to God's callings in their life. And um, the need for people to make God differences in this world is, um, is incredible. And it happens through specific people who discern a sense of call and who are are commissioned or sent out. Second thing I want us to note as we get into this experience of Paul and Barnabas, um, if you've been around the church over the years or at any length of time, you've probably heard of Paul. Um, the Apostle Paul is, as we'll note in just a moment, an important figure, and we, we've probably heard of him if we've been around churches very much. 
we may have heard of Barnabas in the name, but what I want us to note right now is that, that it was Paul and Barnabas. It wasn't just one person going out there as kind of a hero on their own. We might have heard of Paul, but don't forget Paul and Barnabas. And, um, and, and this is important. I, I heard a, a guy say just the other day at a Habitat event, um, an old African proverb, if you want to go quickly, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. We need each other. And, and, and let's be honest about a strange way of understanding God and faith that has evolved in our culture. And that is the notion that a person can be an autonomous Christian. That's the idea that being a Christian is an individual thing, that I am a Christian. All of those thoughts are um, unbiblical and, uh, and different than anything we experience in the story of God's mission. There's no such thing as an autonomous Christian. There's no such thing as being an individual Christian. The very experience of being a Christian is a brotherhood a sisterhood, God-centered relationships of people whose purposes in life are kindled and encouraged and held accountable by relationships. Paul would sum this up most famously in, in his most famous chapter in one of his letters when he said, without love, I am nothing. And there's no such thing as love without brotherhood and sisterhood and a sacrificial living on behalf of the needs of humanity. So, um, so it was Paul and Barnabas. And if we want to go with God's purposes, we don't go alone. We have a brotherhood, a sisterhood, and uh, we're sharpened that way. Well, let's, um, let's spend a minute as we get introduced to this we're going to be doing uh, this Rome series for about six weeks. And in order to get into this, we, we need to be introduced to Paul. So I'm going to spend a little bit of a sidetrack introducing us to Paul here and um, having us feel like uh, if we know him, being reacquainted, and if we don't, we, we should know a number of things. We should know that uh, this apostle was not one of the 12 disciples. He was not among Matthew and Mark and John. In fact, Paul never knew Jesus in the flesh, as important as he is. Uh, he wrote about a fourth, some even say if you add up the pages, about a third of the Bible. And in terms of what would begin to be organized that would become the Christian faith and the church, um, he is the organizer. He's the community organizer. Uh, such a desperate role. I, I saw in the, in the paper this morning that in the violence in Milwaukee, we need a summit to organize community, to surround uh, our neighborhoods with what can be done to, um, to change the, uh, the violence that is, is uh, everywhere. Um, to organize community. The movement that became the Christian church was um, prompted by God's work through Paul. You know, all these letters that he would write, this fourth of the Bible, he's organizing what would become the church. He is unparalleled in the Bible. Paul is uh, a monumental figure in the impact that he had on what became the church. We need to... Uh, be able to, uh, to have this summary in mind because these next uh, six weeks are going to be dealing with uh, his experience in Rome, the capital of the Holy Roman Empire, and why this message of this poor, <laughs> powerless human being named Jesus <coughs> spread to become this worldwide movement and people would receive him as savior and in believing in him 
receive the power to become children of God. Um, some of us need something to happen in our lives in this season of our lives. Some of us know that every day we need to wake up and have something happen in our spirit if we're going to hear and live God's call. So, um, so let's see how God worked here in the life of Paul and ask God to work in our lives. So we, um, so we jump into the details of the 14th chapter that we, we looked at today. The, uh, the mission begins. Now, a couple of maps to help us. As I mentioned, uh, the 13 books that are the letters of Paul, and, and scholars know that uh, there's consensus that Paul's hand probably wrote about seven of those letters. You know, uh, Rome, Ephe Romans, Ephesians, the letter to the, the Colossians, Thessalonians, etc. Um, and, and then there's consensus that though Paul probably didn't put his pen to paper on a number of letters that are attributed to him, they were written by his people or dictated by him, and it was his school of thought. And then, and then finally you have the book of Acts, which wasn't written by Paul, but is written largely about his three missionary journeys. This commissioning that begins today, um, here's the, uh, a map, it's hard to see, so I'm going to show you a little better image, but I, I like this image because it helps place this in uh, the Holy Land and in the area of, uh, of southern Europe. You can see uh, Greece, you can see the Italian peninsula, and uh, you can see down on the right, Jerusalem, and some lines that are describing where Paul's mission began. Let's look at a little bigger, better close-up of this, and you can see more clearly, as the scripture says, they began uh, in a place called Antioch, and, um, and actually he would travel to another Antioch, you can see up on the uh, top, must have been a number of Antiochs, I don't know about that, I... I served my first church in Centerville, and I've realized there's Centervilles all over the United States. Um, and, uh, and so Paul is, is on his first missionary journey, and remember, this is the beginning of what Jesus had said, you shall be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Uh, down in Jerusalem, we can see where it began for Jesus and the disciples. Bear in mind, Jesus probably traveled barely more than 30 miles from home during his earthly life. And so uh, already the church is breaking out quite dramatically all the way north in uh, Antioch and then Paul's missionary journey begins and goes around and we land in this community called uh, Lystra or more formally it would be Lystra, modern day Turkey. And um, it kind of reminds me, uh, you know, what is, what is Lystra, right? <laughs> Who's ever heard of Lystra? It's, uh, it's this nondescript um, small city, and, um, and yet Jesus had said, uh, you'll be my witness to the ends of the earth. Well, uh, I always used to say about my hometown when I grew up, there were 600 people on the population sign. It wasn't the end of the world, but you could see the end of the world from there. And I think for the people in Jerusalem, uh, Lystra felt like the end of the world because it was way out there. But notice, um, it's actually not on this map, but it's on the previous map, a very small indication of a city called Tarsus. God chose Paul with very specific reasons because he knew this area. Paul had been born in Tarsus. This was not the end of the world for him. It was the area that God could reach through him. Why is this relevant? Because each of us has experiences in our life that prepare us for specific times and places where we can be useful. And sometimes uh, that's born out of a lot of pain, incidentally. The stuff we've gone through prepares us to be useful for God in ways that, um, that someone else can't fulfill. So Paul, being a Greek citizen... Uh, and a Jew 
and having been converted into the Christian faith, was uniquely suited to be a missionary in this part of the world. It was pretty far for the disciples, but not for Paul. So he gets in Lystra, and what happens? Well, and by the way, I'll just help you fill in that blank. Where is your Lystra, right? Where's God's beginning in your life? Where does the mission begin? Um, in your life? And how is God launching? So uh, we, we get into the chapter 14, and it's in Lystra that uh, we begin right away with this encounter with a man who'd never walked. And, um, and there's a miracle. And it goes by pretty quickly. I want you to note this moment. We'll come back to it a little bit. But the first thing that happens in Lystra is uh, there is a healing. Now, at that point, uh, it's like <laughs> things get really crazy in this 14th chapter of Acts. It kind of reminds you of like um, one of those old cartoons where something happens and then all of a sudden there's people running all over. Because people come running in and, um, and they're like, Zeus! Hermes, they start saying, uh, Paul and Barnabas are Greek gods. They're, um, they're so eager to have a, a human representation of their mythology. And probably a lot of us, I'm not sure why our school systems have us spend time on the Greek gods, but a lot of us, you know, we know the uh, references to Zeus and Hermes and the other... Um, Gods And these people who watch the healing, they think that that's who Paul and Barnabas are. They run and get one of their cultic priests who's still practicing in the primitive ways uh, which were familiar in the Old Testament among the Hebrew people. This priest brings oxen and he's got to, you know, he's, got to, he's wielding his big knife. He's going to sacrifice and ritualize and spread the garlands and they're going to have this celebration of the presence of Zeus and Hermes in their midst and at the healing of this man. And at that point, Paul says, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Barnabas and I are ordinary people like you. And, um, and he, he goes on to say, look, um, I see among you that uh, God is, has not left himself without witnesses. As in every time and place, God has blessed you with um, the rain and the, and the growing of things and, and um, food in season and, and, um, and the blessings that God has provided for all humanity are known by you. I, I see God's presence, but, but uh, we're just human. And uh, we want to encourage you to turn from your idols. This human tendency that we have to want to experience life with idols, uh, bigger than life people that we would worship or circumstances. But Paul says, uh, Barnabas and I, we're human among you. And and, and, and we don't get to hear the message that he shared that day, but we're going to be hearing it over the next six Sundays. In some form or another, this dramatic experience of God that is not idol worship. Paul says you're not going to find God in your amazing architecture in buildings. You might think that that's how you are with God, but it's not in a building. You're not going to find God in your worship. You know, your sacrificial kind of experiences uh, that you feel like you have to do. Uh, and we tend to make idols out of our particular forms of worship. Uh, you're not going to find God in, uh, in these ways. Turn from these idols. And the message that Paul shares is about the God of creation who didn't stay far off in heaven but became real and human among us. 
and who spent his life tending to souls and nourishing the hungry and healing the sick. Paul said, God hasn't left you without witnesses, but you're going to have to turn from your idols and recognize his presence right here, right now, even in you, ordinary people like Barnabas and I. Recognize God's power here. And, and be transformed by discovering his presence. Well, their heads are spinning, you know, after he interrupted that deluge of activity and said, hold it a minute. They can't quite understand what he's talking about. But there is one guy who gets it. There's one guy who gets it. He'd been broken down and unable to stand for years. There's one guy who had been hoping against hope that his life would not be confined by the circumstances of suffering that had been his lot in life. Paul recognized the presence of God in that suffering man because that's where Jesus said he'd always be recognized, in the hurting, in the broken down, and discovered in the presence of hope and faith that that man had to be healed. And in that man, God uh, launches his mission down to earth among all of us. And the question is really clear. Are we going to stand with that guy? Are we going to walk with him and with Paul and Barnabas in what Paul would describe as the upward calling of Jesus Christ? Are we going to run the race set before us? The question is pretty clear for us. How is God's mission being launched in your life? 